Hi everybody, this is Mrs. Malloy and this is lecture 17.2 and this corresponds to Korea pages 378 to 382 of your textbook. All right, well we have already learned that Korea served as a bridge for Chinese culture to spread to Japan. You know, there are many Chinese influences within the Korean culture. Many works of literature show this Chinese influence. Well, today we're going to look at the origins of Korean culture by first looking back on some of its earliest known inhabitants. All right, well, let's talk first about early traditions. So what was early Korea like? Well, it is believed that the earliest Koreans were nomads who settled on the Korean peninsula. These nomads developed a settled lifestyle when they discovered how to grow rice. Early Korea consisted of three main kingdoms between A.D. 100 and A.D. 668. So putting this into historical perspective, early Korean kingdoms existed around the same time as the Roman Empire and a bit after the fall of the Roman Empire in Europe. These kingdoms included the um, Kogaryo, and I'm totally mispronouncing this, Kogaryo in the north, um, the Pekche in the southwest, and finally, the Shilla in the southeast. And again, pardon my pronunciation. These kingdoms borrowed a lot from the Chinese, including Buddhism and Confucianism. And really, at this point in the year, you should know what those two belief systems consist of or are all about. They also adopted, initially at least, the Chinese script for writing. The Koreans no longer use the Chinese script. So we're going to learn a bit later in the lecture why this is. So how did Chinese culture spread to Korea? Well, three ways. First, China had controlled parts of Korea on and off over the years, so certainly cultural diffusion happened because of this. A second way Chinese culture spread to Korean was due to Chinese Buddhist missionaries. And finally, Chinese culture spread when Koreans went to China to study, and then they brought new ideas home with them. Over time, Koreans adapted Chinese ideas to fit their own needs. These include some of the animistic beliefs regarding spirits in nature. Remember animism? It's a belief system in which people believe that spirits inhabit objects in the natural world. We have learned about animism in other cultures this year, like in early African civilizations. Well, the Koreans not only adopted some animistic beliefs from the Chinese, they also merged some of these beliefs into Buddhism as well. Many Buddhist shrines in Korea often in include offerings to animistic spirits. All right, well, next we're going to talk about powerful dynasties. Remember what a dynasty is? Yeah, we already learned about dynastic rule in ancient China. A dynasty is a ruling family. Well, early Korea had dynasties too. However, Korea only had three of these dynasties. These include the Shilla, the Koryo, and the Choson dynasties. Chosan is also sometimes called the Yi dynasty. Just a heads up on that. Hey, Koryo, does that sound familiar? Yeah, Koryo, right? Well, remember the presentation on Air Koryo? Air Koryo was the airline that the our presenter who came and talked about North Korea, um, that is the airline they flew on to get to North Korea. So I'm not an aviation expert, but I'm pretty sure that the name of this airline reflects the name of the Koryo dynasty and therefore has some significance today for the North Koreans. Just saying. All right, so let's talk about each of these dynasties briefly. The Shilla dynasty was in power from A.D. 668 to 918. It's a long time. That's around the same time as the early Byzantine Empire in Europe, which you'll learn about next year. The Shilla capital was located at Gyeongju, which many, uh, you know, and there are many palaces that reflect Buddhist belief, building styles and beliefs, and um, you're going to see lots of pagodas, so lots of Chinese influence during this period. All right, well, the Koryo dynasty followed the Shilla dynasty and existed from around 918 to 1392, which was really around the time of the European Middle Ages. The Koryo dynasty was known for its many cultural and artistic achievements, but especially for its porcelain called Celadon, which the, you know, was borrowed from the Chinese but then adapted by the Koreans, and it's a special porcelain um, that only they made called Celadon. So we'll talk more about this in class. A well-known Koryo leader was a man named Wang Kong, who built a capital at Kaesong. 
It was during the Koryo dynasty that Koreans adopted the Chinese civil service system to make sure that the most qualified scholars held government and leadership positions in society. The social class system in Korea at the time made social mobility a bit difficult. Usually, only the most aristocratic families had sons who took the civil service exam. So it still wasn't, you know, um, social mobility was very difficult. It wasn't easy for people to move up, um, despite the fact that they had this merit system based on those Confucian values. Other things the Koryo dynasties uh, or dynasty adopted from China include movable type. These were early printing presses, and we've already learned that the Chinese pretty much invented the pr printing press although Europeans like Gutenberg from Germany are often given credit for having invented it. Really, the technology already existed in China. So obviously, if the Koreans had it, they adopted it from China. From China. Other Koryo achievements include religious writings, temples, and Chinese architecture. The Mongols conquered Korea in the 1200s and introduced gunpowder to the Koreans. Remember the Yuan dynasty in China? Also the Mongols were also known as the Mongols. So um, obviously their culture spread um, to, China, to Korea from China because of the Mongols as well. All right, well, the final dynasty was the Choson dynasty or the Yi dynasty, which ruled Korea from 1392 all the way to 1910. Confucianism became extremely popular during this dynasty and Confucian values dominated Korean society. It was during the Choson dynasty that Korea cut itself off from the rest of the world, except for China, with whom it continued to trade. If you recall, the Chinese referred to themselves as the Middle Kingdom. This was the ethnocentric view that Chinese society was the center of the universe. The Koreans subscribed to this theory, or believed in this theory, and they placed great value on all things Chinese. By cutting themselves off from other cultures, except the Chinese, they became known as the Hermit Kingdom. Ever hear of a hermit crab? Huh, I always wanted a hermit crab as a pet when I was a kid. Hmm. Anyway, a hermit is a person who lives in relative seclusion or away from the rest of society. So the hermit kingdom implies that the Koreans were isolating themselves. And not to go off on too much of a tangent, but isolationism is something we hear a lot about in global history. You know, we've already learned about how the Chinese isolated themselves due to their belief in being the Middle Kingdom. We know that there are also geographic factors that can cause isolation. We learned earlier in the year about how the Indian subcontinent was isolated due to the Himalayan mountains and from other parts of Asia. And we also know that the Deccan Plateau divided the subcontinent, causing different cultures to develop between the northern and southern portions of the country. Additionally, over the course of the Korea and Japan unit, we're going to learn about how Japan developed a relatively isolated culture due to its island location. So geography definitely can contribute to an isolated effect or have an isolated effect on a nation. Right. So isolation can be caused by geography or by choice. Korea's designation as the hermit kingdom appears to have been more by choice. Despite the Chinese influence in Korea, they're going to maintain and develop their own culture. In fact, perhaps the greatest example of this is the Korean language and writing system. Have you noticed at all in the videos that we've been watching the Korean alphabet? It doesn't really look like Chinese, right? It was a ruler from the Choson dynasty named Sejong who had Korean scholars develop an alphabet that was phonetically based. Ooh, what does Mrs. Malloy mean? Well, phonetic alphabet means that there are specific sounds attached to each letter. We have a phonetic alphabet, right? Yeah, here in the States. So Sejong wanted a simple alphabet that all Koreans could learn for reading and writing. The Koreans had formerly been using the Chinese character system. Chinese scholars often had to memorize 20,000 characters or more. This sometimes meant that normal people or peasants couldn't learn to write. Sejong's simplification to a phonetic system ensured that more Koreans could become educated and that more people could become scholars. The new alphabet was called Hangul. The original Hangul alphabet contained 17 consonants and 11 vowels. Today, the alphabet has been further simplified to 14 consonants and 10 vowels. Wow, that's 24 letters. Hmm, shorter than our alphabet. The result of this simplification is clear. The Koreans have one of the highest literacy rates in the world, and some believe that this is because or can be attributed to the, their simplified alphabet.
So to review so far, China has influenced Korea throughout history, eventually leading Korea to isolate itself from all other nations and to the point that Korea began calling itself the Hermit Kingdom. There were three primary dynasties, including the Shilla, Koryo, and the Chosan. And finally, Korea was able to um, develop a phonetically based language that has led to an extremely literate population today. So what next? Well, the Chosan dynasty ruled until 1392. What happened after 1392 in Korea? Well, lots. Korea weakened followed the Chosan dynasty with, and became smaller, loosely organized territories with no clear centralized rule. Lack of centralization led to an attack by Japan in 1592. The ensuing war greatly weakened Korea. The Manchu people from Manchuria invaded during the 1600s, later taking over China in between the, the Qing and Ming dynasties. The Manchus allowed the Koreans to rule themselves as long as they paid tribute. A tribute is a payment of some sort or as a sign of gesture or it's a, a sign or gesture of respect. Next year, you're going to learn about how the Mongols took over parts of Eastern Europe like Russia, but let people rule themselves by paying tribute. So it seems clear that the Manchus had the same policy with the Koreans. Because of this situation, Korea further isolated itself from other countries for another 200 years. Well, by the 1800s and the European influence on China, Korea was put under intense Western pressure to trade. Many European nations forced the Koreans to sign unequal treaties, granting trading privileges to the Europeans. The Europeans didn't colonize Korea. Please remember that. Instead, they practiced economic imperialism, forcing them to trade against their will. This was very similar to the spheres of influence that we saw during our China unit, remember? Okay, well, in 1905, Korea was invaded by a newly industrialized and aggressive Japan. The Japanese finally ousted the remaining Chosan leaders and annexed Korea into Japanese territory. To annex means to add a territory to one's own country. To draw a comparison to current events, remember Crimea in Ukraine? We know that Russia is attempting to annex Crimea or Crimea, which is part of Ukraine, and make it part of Russia. Same deal. Japan annexed Korea. And although the circumstances are different, I know, um, similar, similar philosophies at play here. Although the, although the Japanese modernized Korea by introducing technology, building a railroad, etc., this was not for the benefit of the Korean people. The Japanese did this to gain more resources and territory to serve its own people. For instance, although the Japanese introduced new farming methods in Korea, they took over half of all the crops produced to benefit their own people. This imperialism by the Japanese led to a great deal of resentment. The Koreans disliked foreign rule. We've already learned this year about why people hate being ruled by an outside power and how nationalism or a sense of national identity can develop. Remember the colonization of India by the British? Nationalist movements by Indians like Gandhi helped it gain its independence eventually. In China, many Chinese rebelled against foreign influence, like remember the Boxer Rebellion? No one wants to be ruled by a foreign power, and we're going to see a lot of nationalism develop in Korea over time. On May 1st, 1919, many Koreans campaigned for freedom against the Japanese. The Japanese cracked down and stifled the movement, killing over 2,000 people and imprisoning 20,000 others. This led to even more nationalism amongst the Koreans and a further desire to rid themselves of Japanese rule. Wow, that totally sounds like the Amritsar massacre that we studied during our India unit, remember? It only furthered Indian nationalism. During the 1930s and 1940s, Japan took over much of Asia, even forcing Koreans to fight in the Japanese army. The Japanese treatment of Koreans during World War II is still a sore point for many Koreans, even today. For instance, the Japanese forced Koreans to take uh, Japanese last names during the occupation period, and they were not allowed to even use their own language. This was a humiliating experience for the Koreans, who bitterly resented the foreign domination by the Japanese. This will lead to even more nationalism in Korea and eventually the creation of two separate nations. Thanks for listening. Bye.